So good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for attending our MND Queensland educational webinars. And today is um, a really important topic that a lot of you asked for. So um, today we're talking about nutritional care and motor neurons disease. And we have our wonderful dietitian, Matt Hart, who has his own business at Heart Nutrition. I've sent a little bit of a bio about Matt, um, which I'll get Matt to um, explain himself. But what I'll do, as you're aware, we are being recorded. And if you could also, if you're not wanting to be recorded, please just mute your camera, but also if you could mute your um, microphone. So therefore we can actually ask Matt some questions at the end of his presentation. So I'll leave it to you now, Matt. Awesome, thanks Andy. Um, morning guys, thanks for jumping on and joining this morning and for those that have an opportunity um, to jump on and listen to this recording later on. Um, basically today I just wanted to give you guys a bit of a snapshot around I guess some of the key practical considerations that we, I guess, we as dietitians would typically deal with um, when pro pro providing support for those with MND. Because I think a lot of the time that most of us have a general good understanding of nutrition, it's then just trying to identify how do we adapt and apply that um, to those individuals and families that are impacted, really trying to ensure that the, they can maintain the best quality of life for the time that, um, that they have left with us. So. As we said, if possible, just try and hang on to your questions or write them down um, as we go over the next 45 minutes or so, and then um, at the end we can we can try and tick as many off as possible. So basically today, as I mentioned, um, the first thing I want to highlight is basically how dietitians actually can impact the quality of life um, for those that are impacted. Um, more importantly, try and come away with this presentation with an idea of how to navigate um, the the challenges that we do face both practically um, from a time point of view, how do we prepare food, um, how do we provide support for for those family members that we may be um, supporting throughout, and then really trying to identify demands change throughout the course of MND, um, which is an interesting one and uh, essentially we've broken that down into three stages, um, which we'll delve into shortly. A lot of the time I kind of get asked the question, um, how did I or where did my passion um, for MND come from? And to give you an idea, I've been in the healthcare sector for the past six odd years now. Um, so I've had some exposure early on in the piece with MND, but more so unfortunately my auntie um, back in 2020 was diagnosed with MND. So and it, unfortunately at the time she was living interstate. So I guess my input and the input from other family members was quite limited um, based on everyone being scattered around Australia. And I, I think at that time it was a, an eye-opening experience for me really to realise that not necessarily the lack of support, but sometimes the accessibility to some of these supports um, wasn't there. And I think that's when I first contacted Sandy and said, hey, how do we how do we try and make the nutrition a priority and more of a um, a proactive measure as opposed to very much a reactive intervention that it typically is in healthcare? So I guess my mission at the moment is really trying to identify how do we how do we spin the wheel um, and really embed nutrition as a priority from the get go um, for those when they are diagnosed. Um, really to try and sustain a high quality of life throughout the course of MND. Quickly, I think dietitian's an interesting label and personally I don't like it. Um, I think, and I'd be intrigued to get your input as well, but typically when you think of dietitian, there, there's almost a stigma attached to it that it's very much around weight loss. And I think MND, it's sometimes it can be the almost the complete opposite really trying to identify how do we how do we maintain weight throughout the course of MND um, particularly when we start facing some of the barriers from a loss of swallowing capacity losing lung function um, and mobility and so forth again which we'll go through shortly on so 
I, I challenge you to start thinking about, well, how may a dietitian actually help the care that um, you may need individually? And it, as I said, it may not be that it's solely around trying to maintain weight. It may be actually trying to manage pain, whether someone may be experiencing some form of constipation um, or gut um, issues purely based on the lack of mobility. Um, and then how do we navigate some of the food choices to try and support that? When we when I kind of think about how dietitians impact um, the course throughout MND, the number one thing that I'm very much trying to drive at the moment is the, the collaboration with other practitioners, particularly speech pathologists. Um, the challenging part from a dietary point of view is I'm very reluctant to give dietary advice um, until I have an understanding of what level of speech support's been provided, but more so whether there's texture modifications that we need to be wary of to try and prevent things like aspirating and potentially developing pneumonia, um, which obviously comes with its own consequences. So really trying to get on the front foot and have more of a proactive approach in terms of how we do navigate some of these um, barriers. I think for a period of time, I was working in aged care and I think it's very much similar with MND that sometimes there can be some some barriers that may arise around losing a um, lack of interest in food, whether it's be that it's purely based on a lack of mobility to self-feed, whether it's mental health issues may come into the equation. So it's really trying to identify that as a dietitian, how do we ensure that there's still some enjoyment um, within food? And if it's out of, I guess, what would typically consider that healthy eating banner, well, you know what, I'm actually okay with that because if, from my point of view, if that's going to improve someone's quality of life, uh, particularly from a mental health point of view, well, you know what, I'm happy to compromise there. So again, guys, we'll, um, we'll delve through that shortly. Um, and then the big part that I think typically comes from a lot of clients and families is the supplement side of things. So how do we almost use these strategically? Um, knowing that some of them aren't as palatable as what we'd like, um, but how do we use these strategically? Really try and ensure that we, we're trying to um, trying to not necessarily prevent, but really try and delay the, the onset of some of the symptoms associated with MND. So I guess when we think about nutrition, how, how it can actually impact MND, obviously there's a big fatigue element to it. Um, and at the end of the day, like essentially the food that we eat is really going to determine the, the health outcomes and how we feel day to day. So obviously it's quite quite straightforward for a lot of us but think as food is energy food is fuel um, and it's really just trying to identify that we're getting it from the right sources to try and to try and as we said give the best quality of life throughout the journey of mnd um, as i as i briefly touched on that the the nutrition component can significantly impact your gut health um, so depending on the mobility and how active someone may be um, depending on the various stages of where they may lie throughout the course of mnd is well there may be issues and challenges that arise arise there um, the weight management and muscle atrophy um, component is huge again which we'll delve into a little bit further later on um, and then also the pain management and the the loss of swelling capacity. And I think naturally, just quickly, when we talk about weight management is it's not solely just trying to prevent um, weight loss. The importance of trying to prevent that weight loss is really also going to help drive and try and maintain the, the strength in um, someone's swallowing capacity, trying to maintain the strength from a breathing point of view to really try and, as we said, boost that quality of life or maintain that quality of life as best as possible. So I guess in a nutshell, when we look at the nutrition component, um, this is straightforward. And as I said, a lot of us have quite a good understanding of what we should be doing, but I think Generally speaking, and to try and build a good foundation is we, we really do want to start um, with like a quite a diversity of plant-based foods where possible, whether it's fruit and veggies. Um, understanding that throughout the course of MND, obviously your energy requirement is going to significantly increase. So at some point in time, there's going to be, typically speaking, a, a reduction in um, the, the overall uh, 
the quantity of plant-based food that is consumed purely because we're trying to get in some of those energy dense foods to try and prevent that muscle loss and weight loss that is typically seen. Um, obviously really trying to include a lot of whole grain foods to try and help the regular bowel movements, um, lean, lean proteins and healthy fats. And then on top of that, unfortunately, when we do look at um, the nutrition care from an MND point of view is we, we really do lack research, which is frustrating. Um, so it's trying to almost lean on other medical conditions and the, the knowledge and research we do have around those and trying to identify that, how do we actually apply it to those that are impacted from MND. So when, when we do look at motor neuron disease, some of the key nutrients um, that I typically do try and target is antioxidants rich food. And that's really is just to try and reduce that oxidative stress um, from a cellular, cellular level. Um, and then the same with omega-3 omega fats and vitamin B12, they're both pivotal in cellular function. Um, so obviously throughout the course of MND, typically the, the DNA and the cell side of things can be significantly impacted. So it's just trying to identify that, how do we actually include some of these um, key foods and nutrients into someone's dietary intake. So uh, typically speaking, um, I think a lot of referrals or the, the first time that I see a lot of people that are impacted by MND is they're, they're experiencing some degree of malnutrition um, or they're, they're already starting to experience muscle atrophy or muscle loss is the easiest way to think of that. Um, and I, I think the key here, particularly from a support point of view, whether it be family members, friends, um, other practitioners, other touch points that you may have is really trying to identify what are the signs that may be actually um, progressing this or speeding this up outside of MND. And a lot of the time these are signs or symptoms that are um, related directly to it, but at the same time are there, are there flow on effects from that. So some of the signs that I'd typically be trying to identify, has their appetite significantly declined? Um, and has that been a, a progression from reduced oral intake? Um, so straight away I'd be trying to identify how do we actually increase the oral intake without without making that un uncomfortable and unpleasant for the for the individual that we're working with. Um, has fatigue really started to develop throughout the day? And again, that may actually be directly related back to the, the appetite side of things in a decline in oral intake. So you might find that there's strategies that we can implement um, and it may be an example might be relying on the use of fluids to try and increase the overall oral intake and then obviously the flow and effect from that is you might find that there's a change in energy levels throughout the day, um, understanding that there's likely to still be a degree of fatigue there. Um, poor wound healing, particularly if someone's quite immobile, you might find that they're commonly you might see pressure wounds, um, particularly on the bottom of bottoms of limbs, so like the, the buttocks region um, and under the thighs. Um, individuals typically more irritated than usual um, and then obviously are they more prone to illness um, down the track. So again, things just I'd be mindful of um, when, when you do come into contact or when you are supporting family members throughout the course of MND. Some of the, some of the challenges with MND, particularly from a nutrition point of view, um, is the, the involuntary movement side of things. So typically speaking, you might find individuals um, may get the shakes. So straight away that can increase someone's risk of malnutrition because of the, because of the energy expenditure related to that. Um, and then you couple that with the a declining oral intake. Well, the downside of that is the likelihood of weight loss or the rate of weight loss um, potentially may increase. A lot of the other barriers that we typically do see, as I mentioned, is the appetite, um, nausea, constipation. If there's an element of pain, you might find that people are actually um, unlikely to eat as much as what they previously were. Um, and then obviously the mobility and the, the, the practicality to that. So an individual still able to self-feed um, or are they very reliant on other, others to, to help support that um, or even administer supplements down the track. As we said, the mental health side of things can impact it. So 
I'd really encourage you to check in and sometimes ask those harder questions early on in the piece, um, particularly if you're quite new in that environment. It's, 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 I find it pivotal to try and um, build that relationship early on. So when it comes to crunch time, that some of those harder touch points and topics are a little bit easier to navigate. And then the, the final challenge there from a malnutrition point of view is obviously the heightened energy intake. So in simple terms, essentially the, the energy requirement um, for those impacted by motor neuron disease significantly can increase. And then once we start looking at that, uh, along with some of the symptoms that people typically may experience, is it can be quite challenging in terms of how do we actually get enough nutrition in to try and prevent um, some of the signs and symptoms typically seen with MND. So from a dietitian point of view, sorry guys, some of the some of the key goals um, or things that I would typically target, particularly early on in the days, is as we mentioned, slowing the rate of muscle loss. Um, so the the key there is it's it's not just muscles in limbs. So you, obviously your arms and legs. It's it's the you find you find motor skills so it's really trying to support the muscles whether it's in your hands to try and maintain the ability to self feed and eat obviously because we mentioned that there's a lot of enjoyment that comes with that um, it's the muscles that do surround the lungs so obviously over time we find that breathing capacity and lung function does decline so I think when we look at nutrition is it's not purely around trying to maintain weight it's really trying to support the muscle density um, throughout some of those organ functions and, and obviously the limbs really to try and achieve that overarching goal as we said of trying to maintain a high quality of life. Um, along with that is really then trying to identify well, how do we get in that nutrition. So I think as humans typically we're quite habitual with our food intake and it, whether it's breakfast, lunch and dinner with some snacks embedded throughout that sometimes you might find that it's actually easier to try and meet your nutrition requirements through actually um, almost snacking or grazing throughout the day if you like me and like food well sometimes you'd be quite happy to do that so at times there can be detriment if you are having breakfast lunch and dinner and often they're larger meals per se you might find that you're quite full and satisfied for a longer period of time so that the question i would then ask is then are we actually missing a window of opportunity um, to get in some more nutrition to, as we said, try and meet those overall energy and protein targets? Um, again, just something to be mindful of. Um, as we mentioned, that a key part is finding enjoyment in food. Think about how food brings us together and how much happiness um, typically is around food. So that can be quite challenging, particularly when we do see the declining um, dexterity, fine motor skills and so forth. Um, and then obviously, as we briefly touched on before, the pain and bowel side of things can be key, um, again, to try and try and maintain that mental health um, and outlook throughout the course of it. As I said, MND, it's, it's quite challenging from a nutrition point of view, um, purely because we don't have much robust evidence or science behind it. So, it's really trying to identify what signs and symptoms are present and then what, what research or science do we have in other areas that we can almost extract um, and, and utilise to try and address some of these signs and symptoms that we do use. So from the dietary side of things, this, if anything today, guys, this is the part that I want you to walk away with knowing that you can implement some of this at home um, if this applies to you. I typically try and break it down into three stages. So stage one, um, if we're quite proactive with our approach from a nutrition standpoint, is really trying to ensure that we're meeting energy and protein requirements from the get-go. Um, and as we said, it may be that there's got to be slight adjustments in terms of eating routines and patterns throughout the day to do that, because sometimes it can be overwhelming um, in terms of how much we've actually got to consume, um, or most, more so do we potentially just need to increase the density of the food that is consumed um, to try and meet those requirements. Um, the other key part, as I said, is really trying to collaborate with other practitioners. So whether it's your, your OTs, your physios, your speeches and so forth to try and set up a mealtime environment um, that does help those individuals impact and maintain a level of independence. Excuse me. And then obviously the hydration side of things. So 
this can be quite challenging, particularly later on um, throughout the course of MND, particularly if someone is more reliant on fluids to try and consume a lot of their nutrition, um, because it, obviously that can pose a lot of barriers from, from an enjoyment point of view, as we were talking about around mealtime. Um, and then obviously, as I'm sure a lot of you know, that there some people may find there's a build up of more so a, a, a saliva or a water based um, texture in the back of the throat. Or, or it may actually be more of a thicker um, mucus style or phlegm, um, I should say, um, build up. So obviously that then poses its own challenges from a hydration and fluid point of view. Um, so it's really trying to identify and lean in with the speech there as to what textures are going to be appropriate to try and prevent the aspiration risk. In terms of how to actually do this at home, um, this is where like, I'm happy for people to email me or ring me to try and identify what are the an individual's current um, energy requirements and protein requirements, and then ideally, how do we actually try and achieve that? So in an ideal scenario, obviously we, we wanna try and opt for a lot of those healthy and nutrient dense foods, um, which things things might include like your, your nuts, um, a lot of dairy, yogurt, cream, um, even custard um, and cheese, is how do we actually try and include that within your meals? But in saying that, it, I think that our number one priority, as we said, is the quality of life. So if we do have to lean onto other nutrient dense food, whether it be along the like along the line, sorry, um, if whether it's chocolate, cookies, pikelets, um, depending on the swallowing capacity of the individual, again, I'm okay for them to have that because sometimes we need to eat some of that. Um, really to try and ensure that we can get up to that energy requirement that we're after. Um, and it, I think on that note is it can be challenging when you, when we're solely trying to eat fruit, vegetables, whole grains um, and dairy and so forth, lean meats that we're talking about is sometimes it can be quite challenging to meet your energy requirements solely relying on that um, purely because the volume of food is so big. Um, so that's where some of those discretionary items and things that we typically wouldn't encourage all day every day can be quite beneficial. Um, I would try and build a repertoire at home. So when you look at food preparation is what's actually going to be required throughout the course of MND to try, to try and meet these energy and protein requirements. So obviously blenders, slow cookers, um, food processes and so forth can be really beneficial, really to try and soften and get some moisture into that food, um, particularly once the swollen capacity starts to decline. Additionally, I'd start looking at how, how do we actually consume our nutrition? So I, I think a prime example there would be when you start looking at the fatigue side of things is it can be really um, taxing on individuals to try and sit down, eat a meal. Um, and it, you might find with that that the actual meal time starts to extend over a period of time. So the thing I would then, the, the, the thing I would then start to think about or the question I would ask is are there other means or alternatives to consuming that? Um, as you can see on the screen, whether it's through the likes of blended smoothies, um, soups, milkshakes and so forth to again to try and achieve the same nutrition goals um, per se, but just in a di different means of consuming it. Um, and it, finally on that note is particularly if there's a, a, a big fatigue element to it is can we actually produce or start making smaller finger food um, that doesn't require utensils potentially? Um, just to try and make it a bit easier to consume um, some of that nutrition orally. Stage two, guys, um, is when I would start start reviewing some of the, the progression um, in some of those symptoms that are typically associated with MND. Um, so obviously the appetite side of things, the mobility, swollen capacity, pain, and then how is that actually in, impacting someone's um, capacity to consume nutrition orally? And I think this is where we, we can start getting really creative in the ways that we do consume nutrition um, to try and keep that enjoyment element in it. Um, really leaning on whether it's jellies, custards, yogurts, um, smoothies and so forth um, to try and ensure that there, there's still variety in flavour and texture um, within what we've been directed um, to, 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 to ensure that the nutrition is still quite enjoyable. And then obviously the supplementation part is a huge part. I think this is this is an area where I'm quite proactive with, um, and I, I think 
naturally when we look at supplements here's things that spring to mind for a lot of people is things like sustagen ensure a lot of those milk based drinks it, to be honest it doesn't have to be like that um, there's a lot of su nutrition supplements out there nowadays that are that are quite versatile so we've got access to powders um, jellies cakes and so forth particularly the powders that are that are quite versatile that can be mixed up into a range of different foods um, and fluids to to still achieve the same nutrition goals um, and objectives that we would through a lot of the the fluid based supplements but again it, it just takes that um it's almost a chore of just having to know that you've got to consume whether it's five or six milk based supplements per day which which really for no one is going to be um or, or sorry i should say which for most people is going to be quite unpleasant and i guess just to give you a guide guys so like some of the supplements that um i would typically start trialing or encouraging people to try um, as you can see is the ensure and ed vital powder so these a lot of the supplements here are actually almost quite complete nutrition supplements so essentially yeah, they're quite dense in the the micronutrients and macronutrients um, that they contain so the good thing about the powders as i said is they're quite versatile in terms of blending them up whether it's soups mashed potato smoothies um, and so forth the on the right hand side up the top you can see there's a couple of drinks so typically speaking a lot of people um, seem to actually quite enjoy the the resource beverages so they're actually more of a juice option so it's almost the same as drinking things like apple juice oj um, tropical breakfast juices but just in a nutrition supplement form so it's obviously it's a, a lot more concentrated in terms of the the nutrition content that it provides um then some of those milk based beverages down the bottom um we've got things like screamy so they're actually a, quite a dense ice cream product um and then obviously you you've got things like um like fruit mixes that have essentially been blended up that are also op another option and then on the right hand side there there's things like polyjewel this is there's certain circumstances I would use this. It's not something I'd go to every day. Um, this is, this would be something solely if we're almost at um, like the very end of, of MND and someone was significantly struggling to get in enough um, energy in the form of carbohydrate um, to try and to try and manage some of the fatigue side of things that we typically see. And then stage three. This is an interesting one, guys. I, I think. I really encourage you to start these conversations early on because they can be tough conversations to have for some people. Is it? It's starting to look at what are our options um, beyond oral oral intake. So, and it, it may be in the form of a peg um, or a rig insertion. So, the benefit of this. Um, understanding that it's not for everyone, but the benefit of this is it does take some of the some of the fatigue and some of the I guess the the mental draining side of things out of the equation um, as I said knowing that you've got to drink whether it's five six supplements a day can be quite overwhelming so there, there's different ways to approach this whether it, it, it may be that you put two through the peak and you try and consume a couple orally um, depending on where you're at obviously throughout the course of MND the flip side of that is, do, is does it all go through the peak and obviously the benefit of that is the the family time and the time that you get to spend with um, those close and loved ones um, obviously in a much more comfortable state than trying to trying to eat food orally um, knowing that your swelling capacity is starting to decline and I, I think this is it's really a safeguard mechanism that I see that if you can get this administered early um, as I said it's not for everyone um, but if you can get it administered early, it takes some of the pressures off, particularly when we start seeing some of the decline from a breathing capacity point of view. Um, the challenge is that some people can't have them administered once your breathing capacity does start to decline. So, and that, that's solely because um, the, the procedure that you have to go in to get it um, inserted, you, you have to go into an anaesthetic. So the, it becomes quite challenging to, to navigate there. That's it um, from me, guys. So now I basically just wanted to open it up to you guys and really just have a, an open chat around um, the questions you guys have and the challenges that you may you may see and have faced um, and a, more to pick my brain in terms of how I can support you guys moving forward.
Thanks, Sandy. Thanks, Matt. That's yeah, wonderful. That's wonderful. And there's a few things that, again, I've learned, which is great. Um, those three nutritional strategies are great for everyone to actually include or um, start thinking about, as you said, the final um, slide about looking at a peg um, for nutritional supplements early in the piece is something um, worth starting those discussions about. So Marie has a question. So Marie, I'll unmute you so you can ask away. It's still, okay. My question is about uh, meal sizes and the effect on the diaphragm with breathing. I'm yep. finding that um, I seem to get quite breathless after a meal. Yeah. So I think that there's a few things I'd consider there, Marie. Um, obviously, one being is it, how taxing is it on you actually eating that meal, and particularly if you find that meal times are, I guess, starting to extend. Um, the the second thing is the volume of food. So obviously, mm -hmm. the way that the the muscle dexterity and the the muscle atrophy piece, um, it becomes quite challenging to navigate. So the two components I'd look at there first of all is the the composition of the food you're consuming. So can we actually increase the energy in the process? The energy in the process to try and. Uh, I'm pretty much having a normal diet. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, um, but I'm just finding that. Because I've got a hiatus hernia. <laughs> okay, yeah. That, that doesn't help, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And depending on where that sits, um, but I, the the one thing I would try from the from basically today um, and just see how you go is actually reducing the volume of food you consume. And as yeah. I said, it may be that you're having more snacks in between. Yeah, you've almost got to drip feed it throughout the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. As opposed to, as I said, like a lot of people, we kind of just get stuck in our ways and have whether well, it's three or four big meals throughout the day and that's it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's just trying to identify what's going to make you most comfortable moving forward and that's where the, the small okay. meal or snacks may be beneficial. Now, I did have one suggestion. Um, I bought my husband a instant pot multi-cooker that also has an air fryer, so it pressure cooks. Right. Um, so it does everything and because yeah. he's doing most of the cooking <laughs> and he's been a godsend <laughs> <Training well. laughs> because it's a lot less effort for him to use that appliance. That's really yeah. good. That's good. Now, Andrew, do you have a question? Oh, just a question about disordered glucose metabolism. In MND, apparently it's relatively common to have problems with that and that and um, and just wondered about whether people could consider having a low GI diet. Yeah, sorry, Andrew, I didn't catch the first part of that completely. What or disordered? Well, there's di often disordered glucose metabolism with um, an insulin resistance. Yeah, yeah. And whether a low GI diet might be advised for everyone. Yeah, yeah. I've um, that one in particular is very individualised. So depending on whether there's, um, oh, it could be a range of things, whether it's from like hereditary, um, individual medical concerns that, that have been coupled with MND or whether that's actually started to arise throughout the course of MND. Um, like there's definitely health benefits to consuming low GI diets uh, or low GI food products, I should say. Um, the challenging part there is trying to identify where do they come from. So I think naturally I get my brain straight away goes to, all right, if we're starting to look at low GI foods, a lot of the time they're, they're higher in fibre. Um, the challenge there may become is from a swelling capacity, does that then pose issues? And that's where I'd handle that one straight as speechy. Um, but in short, mate, yes, I would encourage low GI food choices. Thanks, Matt. 
Richard, do you have a question? Hang on. You'd need to unmute yourself, sorry. Is that better? Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay, Matt, I play golf five or six days a week. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm very uh, bad balance and all that, but I've got special uh, a uh, yeah, special uh, compensation from from the club. Um, I take two Nurofen uh, before I play about an hour before, and yep. then probably after eighty after nine holes, I'll take another two. Is yep. that the best pain relief? Because I get pain from walking. Yeah. Okay. So is it more muscular pain, mate? Sorry. Can you can you describe the pain to me? Ah, uh, just. Because I limp really yep. badly and yep. it hurts to walk and I've still got to walk, even though I use a buggy, I've still got to walk to the tea and, you know, walk to the, the green and it's still a fair bit of walking and it actually hurts to walk. Yeah, okay. Um, that's a, to be honest, mate, great question. I think this um, just boils back to what we're just talking about. So when you look at pain, there's a few things that we can do from a dietary point of view. Um, understanding that the pain associated with MND, uh, from my point of view, I kind of look at it as we may be able to impact the severity of the pain in terms of alleviating the pain that may be quite challenging. And that's purely based on not having research. Um, but in saying that, uh, I'd start looking at the food choices that you're actually having um, the night before, the morning off before you go and play golf and potentially what you eat throughout throughout um, the game of golf, mate. And the reason I say that is the glycemic index side of things can impact um, the, the severity of pain for someone that didn't have MND. Um, so I'd start utilising some of the some of the principles that we know in terms of managing pain generally. Um, yeah, yeah whether it's actually going to help impact you, mate. Um, I but just had as <laughs> had my breakfast as I was watching this and it was uh, baked beans uh, and two poached eggs on toast and a cup of tea and that's yep. pretty that's pretty good, good. Sort of breakfast yeah yep. yep great uh, yesterday it was po a peach uh, what do you call it um <sighs> rolled oats with uh, sliced peaches and um, almonds, almonds on top oh no uh, cashews on top. Yeah, big game, mate. Fantastic. I think, um, like breakfast in particular, when you start looking at the glycemic index of food, things that, like, and this is, I guess, just to get it clear, guys, this is specific to to you, mate. That um, some some things that I'd try and avoid at brekkie by the sounds of this, is like a lot of the year, your heavily or high sugar based cereal products, um, whether it's like Nutrigrain, Cocoa Pops, Milo cereal um what else like even sometimes apple juice and orange juice typically might have um a higher gi so if you start coupling juice and then a higher base um cereal product together that may actually increase or impact the severity of the pain side of things okay um, but it sounds like I, breakfast is like, mate. I saw a dietitian i'm in townsville yeah, and I saw a dietitian um, probably three weeks ago, and yep. I used to eat cornflakes and um, the uh, fruit, the nuts, you know. Yeah. She yep. said, no, 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 get rid of cornflakes and go, yeah. go to uh, wheat fix, which, you know, I've done as yeah. soon as she said that, you know. Yeah, fantastic, mate. Sounds she, like you're on the right track. She is wonderful. That's Good to hear. Thanks, Greg. We've actually got a few more questions. So, Greg Eves, um, you have a question for us? Uh, yes, Sandra, no, a, a, a question. I think that uh, I found I, I was losing weight at a, a rather rapid uh, rate. And um, you know, this was, was the cause of it. I, I've just lost all um, all interest in eating a a big meal, um, and what I did uh, in consultation with with um, 
with the OT and, and and dietitians and that. Is I went very early once uh, the weight loss had been identified uh, into grazing more so than having you know um, two or three meals a day. So basically, I uh, up and had breakfast and then uh, literally um, you know, graze all day. Um, I, I haven't put weight on, but at least we've been able to um, to stabilise it so that I haven't lost any more weight. So yeah, that grazing technique uh, definitely works. That's good to hear, mate. I think. Um the challenge sometimes that I see a lot of people face actually is trying to change the habits around food. So if you've managed to do that, yeah, you've done well. Thanks, Greg. So Arnie, um, do you have a question as well? Yes, good morning. Um, I'm having trouble with um, getting a lot of stomach pain and and uh, I've been trying to narrow it down what in my diet is causing it and I wondered if I'd become lactose intolerant but the other thing too is that um, my stools I, I went through a stage when I thought I had um, um, not dysentery what's uh, um, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a stomach upset. Yeah, but it's gone on for too long. And um, yeah, we just. He's so you're loose all the time. Yeah, I'm loose all the time, and sometimes I don't quite get there. And mm. and, and uh, it's been going on for a while, Arnie. Yeah. Yeah. So th there's a few things I'd look into there, mate. Like you, you nailed it on the head. I um. I'd actually be looking at the types of food that you're consuming because you might find that there's a slight um, a slight allergy or sensitivity to something that you're consuming that's actually exacerbating or triggering that. Um, I think the tricky part there is sometimes food that's perceived as healthy um, can actually be an issue for some people. Um, so, yeah, to be honest, mate, the best thing to do there would be almost to record what you eat over say two or three days um, and then find a dietitian nearby um, or even give me a ring if you want um, and then I'd just try and identify any triggers that potentially may be in there and then pull them out see how you go um, and then yeah it'd just be a it'd be a bit of a trial and error slash review process that's yep. that's an MND thing. is that an MND, MND thing or is it um, it, not directly, typically speaking, mate. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, we're trying to do that to go through a process of elimination. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. So, Arnie, if you have problems finding a dietitian where you are, as Matt said, if even if you want to send me an email of what's happening, I'm happy to forward it on to Matt. Yeah, that's great. Um, is that okay with you, Matt? He's frozen. He has frozen. No, that's <laughs> fine. He'll come back, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so I'm attached to the invite. So if you just send it back to me, yeah, and then yeah. I'll I'll take it up with Matt. So, okay. Matt looks like he's frozen now. Um, so Sorry, what, we, <laughs> yeah, what we might do, um, okay, no, he's back, I think. Yeah. Let me just, let's just wait for a little minute. If not, because there's been some great stuff. Um, a lot of things that Matt's brought up, like even the hypermetabolism, the strategies that is brought up are very important, I think, for all of us, um, particularly for our community with MND. So what we might do is I'll stop recording now and I'd like to thank everyone for coming. If you do actually have any questions at all, if you want to email me and I'm happy to um, 
to forward them to Matt for you. Marie, I know you've just put in a question there. So what I'll do is if you even send it to me, then um, I can actually formulate something to send to Matt. So Matt's, I'm sure you understand, Matt's very passionate about supporting MND community because he's experienced it himself personally. So yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed today. I'll actually stop recording now.